tonight we're going to be continuing our message from Sunday. We talked about progressing in our relationship with God. Say this with me. It's not about religion, but relationship. It's been about relationship from the very start. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to save us, not to set up a religion, but to save us and to make us one with him. It's always been about love, for God so loved the world. It's always been about relationship. And the deeper that we go into this relationship, thank you, I'll bring this to you shortly. The deeper we go into the relationship with God, the more he reveals to us, the more things that he tells us uh, in those closer stages with him than we would have known on the outside. Now, Sunday we talked about a big target, a big circle with many little circles inside of it. And we talked about progressing in our relationship with God. We're all born outsiders. We're all born sinners, okay? And that's why Jesus had to come to save us. But we don't stay on the outside, right? We want eternal life with God. So we receive him as our savior and we're made new. Our sinful nature is done away with and we become new in Christ. So we step into that relationship with him as sons and daughters. But then we even progress from sons and daughters to friends. Because unfortunately, you can have sons and daughters that you're not friends with. Okay, so friends can be even a deeper intimacy than just sons and daughters. So he calls us um, sons and daughters. He also says that we can, we can uh, desire to be servants. So I think that's how we did it. We said sons and daughters, then servants, then friends. So I think it's very good that we respond to whatever God calls us. So if he calls you a friend, then you need to be willing to call him a friend as well. But you have to know that within that uh, friendship are parameters and guidelines. And he says that, listen, if you desire to be my friend, then I need you to obey my commandments. And it might seem hard to do that as an outsider. But when you're an insider and you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, obeying his commandments becomes your delight. And the Holy Spirit helps you within to obey his commandments. You've got help on board and your sinful nature is done away with. And then Jesus says this, I no longer call you servants. Now I call you friends. And then even from friends, we progress to the final relationship that we should desire to have with our Lord, which is the bride. He's coming back after a church, which is going to be his bride. So think about it. This is, what, this is what church really is. God has given gifts to the church, you know, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, all right, to empower the church. But just think about this. Look at all the things that a bride does on her wedding day or the day before. Nails done, hair done, possibly have been on a diet for months, uh, working out, walking, eating right, um, makeup done expensively, wedding gown is expensive. Just all these things that a bride does to get ready for her wedding day. Say this with me. The church is the bride of Christ. So every time we come to church and when you're doing devotionals and when you're praying on your own, you're getting ready for your wedding day. You've got to see yourself as the bride of Christ. And as we do that, we allow our relationship with the Lord to become more and more and more intimate. Uh, when a couple gets married, there's two words they exchange with, with each other. What are those two words? I do. I do. That means that they vow to do all the things that the pastor or the preacher said before them. They vow to do that. And we're going to talk a little bit about the word I do, and then after that, the word only as well. Let's begin. We're going to start in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 27. Your life will drastically improve if you hear these words from Jesus and follow his patterns. When Jesus came to this earth, he said many times, I've only come to do the will of who? My father. That's it. He was so focused on his father's will and he lived a sinless life. How many of you believe he lived a sinless life? Our salvation is riding on that, right? He lived a sin, sinless life. And listen to what his attitude was. Listen to this. 
We're in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 27. John replied, I'm sorry, that's going to be in the next passage, but we're going to hear about the bride here. John 3, 27. John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride. And the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. So John was even letting them know in that day that he was not the Messiah, but the Messiah was the bridegroom. Or, or Jesus Christ was going to come back one day and gather all of those that will live with him forever. And another term for all the people that will live with God forever is the bride. And that's how we've got to see ourselves, not as sinners, not just as servants, not just as friends, but as the bride of Christ. Amen. Let's go to John 5, 19 through 20. Now, here's what we need to be focusing our lives on a lot more. And I'm telling you, it will help you throughout your day. It will strengthen you and encourage you. If you remember this passage in the teaching that we're doing tonight about I do and only. Remember when a bride and a groom exchange vows, they exchange the I do's and only puts the icing on the cake as it relates to this passage. So John 5, 19. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Can you say only? We would avoid so much mess and stress and drama. We would have so much less to repent of in our lives if we only did what the Lord desires us to do. How many of you take control sometimes and have to say, Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that about that person. I shouldn't have did that, all right? Because at times we get in the driver's seat and we do something that seems right, but Jesus never did that. Jesus never operated out of the context of something that he willed up. The only thing he ever did was what he saw the Father doing or what the Father told him to do. Because he belonged to the Father and he loved the Father. You must, be, you must know this, that as the bride of Christ, can you say bride? I really want you to own that word, bride. Not just servant, not just son, but bride. We're only going to do what our Lord desires that we do. Let's continue. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing. In fact, the Father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will be truly astonished. As I said, this passage has been helping me a lot since God has opened my eyes up to the word only. Can you say only? When you start to operate your life in the only, you, things begin to stand out to you that are outside of the will of God. Like a thought will cross your mind and you'll say, you know what? That doesn't sound like something the Lord would say, think, or do. And the only action that I'm going to let come out of my mouth or my heart or the only activity I'm going to allow from my body or my mind is what Jesus would have done or Jesus would have said. Now, that, this bracelet uh, that used to be very popular, WWJD, what that stand for? What would Jesus do? And that's grown unpopular, but I think we need to bring that back in our minds about what we do on a daily basis. Would Jesus do this or would Jesus say this? Let's go on to Luke chapter 10. We're going on to Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 38. And we're going to distinguish the difference between religion and relationship. See, the outside world thinks that we're just super religious people, but it's not about a religion. It's about relationship with Jesus Christ because we've come to understand that he loves us so very much that we can't help but to love him back. And the only thing that we're doing religiously sh should be is loving him, honoring him, and obeying him. Amen? You can be ultra-religious but still not have a very good relationship with God. 
It's all about your relationship. And what builds relationship? Time together, honor, obeying, laying down our life for the one who loves us. Let's look at uh, the story of Mary and Martha here, all right? We're in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. It says this, As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed her him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. So what we see here is that Martha had a very uh, a religious mindset, thinking that if I do all this work, it'll get Jesus' attention, and he will see that I am more devoted to him by all the work that I'm doing for, her, for him. And Martha got angry that Mary was just sitting there when there was all this work to be done, okay? Because Martha was doing the thing that seemed right. Can you say seemed right? See, religion will have you doing things that just seem like the right thing to do. But relationship will have you in a place where you're always after the heart of God, not the attention of men or the attention of God. You're always after the heart of God. So let's see what Jesus said in verse 41. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. She was sitting at Jesus' feet, loving him, listening to the word. Can you say relationship? That's what it's all about. It's about your relationship with God. Now, a man can spend 80 hours a week at work trying to uh, purchase the biggest home and the nicest car and the nicest clothes and the nicest vacations for his wife, but he's never home to see her, but just wants to do all this stuff for her. And I bet if he asked her which she would rather have, she would say, honey, I would just rather have you at home. Some women would say, you speak for yourself. But it's about building a relationship with God because all this stuff is going to disappear. All this stuff is going to lose value. And we're going to stand in front of God one day and we're going to desire to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Say this with me, church. Lord, help me to choose wisely. Mary chose wisely. She chose to sit at the feet of Jesus because her love for her, him was strong, and she recognized that she, he had a love for her as well. Listen to this thought that came across my, my heart uh, earlier, and I believe the Lord put it there. Uh, just listen to this. The cross Christ commands us to carry is the engagement ring to his bride, the church. Think about that. When a man wants to marry a woman, he gives her an engagement ring, saying, I have a plan to marry you, okay? Uh, she's to wear that at all times, right? Because it signifies that she's taken, and there's a man that loves her and is going to one day make uh, her his wife. Let's continue. The only reason to take it off is if we were planning to do wrong. We must passionately pursue our beloved with a joyful obedience rooted in love. So here's, here's what I'm saying. Jesus says that if any of us desire to be his disciples, we must pick up our crosses daily, deny ourselves, and follow him. So the only way to follow Jesus and be known by him and others that we are his is if we're carrying that cross. So just like an engagement ring, or even after a couple is married, all right, those rings should be on at all times. So, a husband comes home from work. You know where this story's going, don't you? A husband comes home from work. When he left that morning, the ring was on. 
But when he comes home from, let's just say, a business trip, that rings off. Wives, do you have some questions for your husband? You got some questions. All right. Where is your ring and why was it off? All right. Now, there might be some innocent reasons, okay, but we're not going that way with this story, all right? The only reason that someone that's married or engaged would take their ring off is if they had a plan to do wrong and present themselves as not taken. So think about that as we pick up our crosses and follow after God. That There is really no reason to ever put it down except if we plan, listen, except if we plan not to deny ourselves. We carry the cross to deny ourselves, to say, Lord, it's not my will, it's your will that I desire to carry out. We must know that the Lord says that he, we will know his voice, my sheep know my voice, and a stranger they will not follow. We must also realize that if we begin to live our lives within the circle of the friendship with God, all the way to the bride of Christ, that we're going to uh, encompass that word only. And that word only is so powerful that Jesus even used it when he had one of his greatest battles on earth. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4. If Jesus could get the victory through the word only, we can do it as well, all right? We're in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Okay, so listen, the devil knows our weaknesses. He knows how to tempt us in our weakest moments, okay? But we see that Jesus was so set on doing the will of the Father that he denied himself. Can you say he denied himself? I'm telling you that the only way to be victorious over sin and temptation is to carry that cross that Jesus told us to pick up and have the ability to deny ourselves. Verse 4, but Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word or only that that comes from the mouth of God. That can help us in our lives tremendously because every time we step outside of the word of God and the will of God, that's sin. We're putting down the cross or we're taking off the ring and we're willfully sinning. Now, there are times where you might stumble because none of us are perfect. You might stumble, but no husband or no wife accidentally takes off their ring and goes to sin. That's not stumbling. That is calculated, okay? And that is the reason we must continue to carry the cross at all times and continue to deny ourselves. I want you to see the beauty of the cross in a way that you've never saw it before. The cross that Jesus is calling us to carry as an engagement ring, saying, I belong only to you, God. I'm not going to cheat on you. I'm not going to dishonor you. Every time temptation comes to me, I'm going to look at this ring or look at this cross and say, no, I'm going to obey the word of God only. Let's continue. Uh, Philippians. Let's go to Philippians for a moment. We're going to pause in Matthew, and we're going to go to Philippians, all right? We're going to get some encouragement here from the scriptures, okay? The Word of God is so important that you all need to be studying it in your free time and building yourself up and encouraging yourself so that you can memorize some Bible verses. Memorize them so that any time that you're going through something, Jesus sent back the Holy Spirit to be a reminder of all truth. So you've got to memorize some Bible verses for particular situations. So if you're going through a sickness, then there's Bible verses about healing. If you're going through depression, there's Bible verses about joy. And you allow those Bible verses to become part of you so that when temptation comes your way and the devil says, you know what, you're not going to live or you're not going to have enough money to pay the bills, you will have scripture deep inside of your heart that will cause you not to sin against God. Now remember David said, 
Your word have I hidden in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Because the enemy is always trying to get us focused off the word of God onto our situation so that we would put down our crosses, take off our rings, and follow after his method. But we're not going to do that. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. Paul is telling us to remember some of these things that God has gifted us with. And remember, during the temptation of Jesus, he said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So let's listen to these verses. And as we do, I want you to remember that anytime your joy is under attack, your peace is under attack, you don't believe that lying rascal you put your trust and hope in, the, in, in God's word and in these verses. And let's just see by uh, these words we will live. Philippians chapter 4, it says this. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Okay? So, as I said, sometimes depression is going to come your way. Sometimes sadness is going to come your way. But you do not have to accept it. Because the word of God is what we live by. And Philippians 4 says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. How many of you ever have sad thoughts? They come, don't they? But we don't have to receive them. We don't have to live by them. Philippians 4 says that we can. See, there wouldn't be a, a verse in here or there wouldn't be a command in the word of God if it wasn't true and if it doesn't work. So this is an anti-depression uh, and this is anti-anxiety right here if you can just do what the word of God says. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. How much should we be full of the joy of the Lord? Always. You say, well, that's not possible. There's things that just happen in my life, and you don't know what I'm going through. The Word of God trumps your feelings. The Word of God trumps your situation. And if you want joy, you can have it, because the Bible says that we can always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Verse 5, let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Verse 6, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. So remember, Jesus was hungry, very hungry. If we don't eat for four hours, we're hungry. He hadn't eaten for 40 days. And the devil came to him and said, I know that you're hungry. Take this bread and turn it into stone. And Jesus said, nope. Nope, the word of God says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, verse 6 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. So what's the devil do? He comes to you, all right? He knows you're going through a situation, and whatever situation you're going through, he's trying to get you to worry. But he tried to get Jesus to eat too, didn't he? But Jesus said, nope, I don't live by bread alone. I live by the word of God. So here's the word of God for those of you that are battling any kind of depression or anxiety or that you're worriers. The first thing you need to stop doing is calling yourself a worrier. Stop calling yourself a worrier and begin to refer to yourself as something else because you can only be what you see yourself as, okay? It says, always, I'm sorry, don't worry about anything Instead, pray about everything. So the devil tried to get Jesus to eat bread. He refused it. The devil's trying to get you to worry sometimes. So what should we do? Refuse it. I'm, I'm not going to eat that. I am not going to partake of worry. Instead, I'm going to pray. Say this with me. Instead of worrying, I'm going to pray. That's exactly what you do. Every time worry comes your way, you start to pray. As I was going through my kidney failure, there were times where I had to sit down on the toilet in the bathroom just to brush my teeth because I was too weak, okay? And every once in a while in my mind, I would just be saying, I am so weak. I am so weak. I am so... And that was becoming my confession. But I would get up in that mirror and I would look at myself 
And I would say this, I am so weak, but through God, I am strong. But through God, I am strong, okay? Instead of letting worry overtake us, we must overtake worry with prayer. Let's continue. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as long as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, all right? This is so important because we are defeated or we have victory in our thought life. However you're thinking is going to determine whether you're going to be depressed for the rest of the day or whether you're going to have joy for the rest of the day. And this is what Paul said. He said that we should refuse to worry. And then he tells us what to think about, all right? Verse 8, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So we must understand that our feelings or our emotions are just like a thermostat, okay? So if you're depressed or sad or worried or anxious, that's a thermostat on your, of your mind and of your spirit. That just means that you've been thinking negative thoughts and your emotions and your spirit are leaning towards depression because it can only follow your thoughts. Your feelings follow your thoughts. So we must change that around. When you feel yourself starting to sink, it's better to praise God. It's better to pray. It's better to think about good things instead of those things that the enemy is trying to feed us to bring us defeat. Amen? Amen. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 28. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 28. It says this, Be careful to obey all my commands so that all will go well with you and your children after you because you will be doing what is good and pleasing to your Lord. When the Lord God goes ahead of you, and destroys the nations, and you drive them out and live in their land, do not fall into the trap of following their customs and worshiping their gods. Do not inquire about their gods, saying, how do these nations worship their gods? I want to follow their example. So what this is saying to us in this moment is, God has been so good to us. He's brought us through so many victories. But what happens is this. We have short-term memory sometimes. And when a new problem presents itself, we just get so worried that we forget about all the wonderful things that God has already done for us. And, and God is telling us in the beginning of this uh, passage that we just need to be careful to obey all his commands and not go chasing after anything else. And what really needs to happen is found in Romans 12 and 2. And it says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Say this with me, Lord, please help me change the way I think. And the, the reason that we're saying this right now is we're talking about growing in our relationship from just a friendship with God to becoming an actual, the actual bride of Christ and following hard after him. Addison, you're probably going to have to unlock that, please. We need to get into the point of the relationship where God commanded that a man and a woman uh, are to marry, and then the two become one. Thank you. The two become one. So that's our goal, and that's our aim, is to become one with God. We have to know that his final destination for us is, of course, to live in his kingdom forever. And we are to become the bride of Christ, to be one with him. I want to read this footprint poem, and I want you to think about that oneness with God that we're trying to achieve, okay? It says this, one night I dreamed a dream. As I was walking along the beach with my Lord... So that's friendship, right? Walking with somebody, that's friendship, okay? 
and you would think that there would be two sets of footprints, right? You're walking with somebody, all right? Across the dark sky flash scenes from my life. For each scene, I notice two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I look back at the footprints in the sand. I notice that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me. So I asked the Lord, asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said, once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you the most, you would leave me. He whispered, my precious child, I love you and will never leave you. Never, ever. During your trials and testings, when you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. So listen, listen to this. Jesus promised that he would never leave us or never forsake us, ever, okay? And during the hardest time of my life, when I was uh, battling a disease, um, the first thing I asked God was this, like, what did I do? Is this punishment for something that I did? I, I, that's the way that I saw it. But now I see it as, that was an open door for the Lord to carry me and to be my strength. And some of you wonder, why do I go through so much stuff? I try to be a good person. I try to do what's right, but things just keep happening to me. Let me tell you something. That is the time where God is the most intimate with us because the word says that when we are weak, then he is strong. So it's in those moments that we feel like, God, where are you? And we're just so troubled that he's desiring to, to let us see that we are one. We are one with our Lord and we are one with our Savior. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God calls us what? He will deliver us from them all. Father, I pray for this church tonight that we would see our trouble, Father God, not as something that you bring to us, God, because you're mad at us, that we would see our trouble only as an opportunity for us to get closer to you. Because unfortunately, some of us won't pray unless there is trouble. Unfortunately, God, we won't call out and cry out to you unless there is trouble. But Father, here's what we're after. We're after one set of footprints in the sand even during the good times. May we come to the point of unity with you that we only want to do what you do. May we come to the point of unity with you that we forsake ourselves and follow hard after you. May we begin to see our relationship with you as romance and not religion. May we begin to see that you came to save us simply because you love us, not to start a church. You love us. Father, I pray for these people tonight to begin to see that what we're doing right now is we're in the dressing room and we're preparing ourselves for the groom who you are. For your word says that you're coming back after church without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. May we ready ourselves for you. And the only way that we can show you that we love you, God, is by obeying your commandments. And that's what the ring does. That's what the engagement ring does. That's what picking up the cross and following you does. It allows us to deny what we feel and what we want to do, the wrong things, and let's just say, God, I only want to please you. So, Father, I pray these things over your people tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. It's so very important that we daily pick up our crosses and deny ourselves. Every time we step out without our crosses or without the ring on, 
we open up ourselves for so much temptation and we have to understand that we are engaged to be married. Do you ever think about that as the church, that we're the bride of Christ? We're engaged to be married, and that should change everything about what we do. It should break your religion in half. Prayer, does not ha prayer is not a duty once you see that Jesus loves you so much and he only wants to be loved by you Prayer not, is not a religious duty, but it becomes something you desire to do because you love him and he loves you. Amen.